Related to our mission of supporting and fostering learning through the generation and sharing of knowledge, ACPA acknowledges the painful history of genocide in the United States for Native, Aboriginal, and Indigenous people. We honor and respect the many and diverse tribal nations and people who were forcibly removed from, as well as those still connected to this land. We particularly acknowledge and recognize that the land upon which our international headquarters is located today has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst a number of Indigenous people, including the Akahanic, Pokemok, Piscataway, Anacostank, Mattapaniant, Nagamank, Pomunky, Tawihent, Nanticoke, Chickahominy, Monacan, Mattaponi, and Assateague Tribal Nations as the original occupants of the Washington, D.C. region. The ACPA Generativity Project is a current and long-term initiative with the purpose of documenting the voices and perspectives of higher education today, built upon the past and actively pointing toward our future. In this project, we seek to capture the legacies and leading voices and experiences of trailblazers in our field. During a 1982 dinner in Washington, D.C., discussing ideas to advance the student affairs field, L. Lee Neffelkamp, a leading scholar and speaker of the student development movement, shared a vision for capturing the wisdom and experiences of elders with then ACPA president-elect Susan Kovavez. 1982 to 1983 ACPA president Kovavez took this idea to the ACPA executive council in the form of a proposal to create the generativity project. During Dr. Komavez's presidency, she announced the creation of the Generativity Project to devise and widely share student development theories via media technology. The project evolved after that to include living histories and other professional development material. Beverly Gelwick was the first chair of the Generativity Project Committee from 1982 to 1984. Legendary ACPA leaders Layla Moore, Susan Komavez, and Dennis C. Roberts followed in future years as chairpersons and leaders of this important work. A full history of key dates, influencers, and actions related to the Generativity Project is provided at the conclusion of this video. As we approach ACPA's 100th anniversary in 2024, ACPA continues the work inspired by Nefelkamp, initiated by Komavez, and actualized by Gelwick, Moore, and Roberts to capture and share the association's and student affairs profession's history from a number of perspectives. ACPA has made these historic videos available to members online through the ACPA member portal. Just click the resources tab. ACPA extends gratitude to Dr. Denny Roberts and Dr. Susan Komavez for their recent efforts to recreate the important history of the Generativity Project. ACPA acknowledges that this video has been produced and distributed through technology that may not be readily accessible to all members. Often referred to as the digital divide, we acknowledge that ready access to employment or wealth that provides computers, internet, or other technologies is not available to everyone who may benefit from the wisdom and information shared in this video project. Upon request, we are willing to provide a written transcript of this video interview please email info at acpa.nche.edu. Thank you to the featured panelists in this Generativity Project video, recorded via Zoom on 23 October 2023, including Andrea D. Domain, 2022-2023 ACPA President, Susan Komavez, 1982-1983 ACPA President, George Ku. Denny Roberts, 1985 to 1986 ACPA president, Larry Roper, and Elizabeth Witt. This session was moderated by Antonio Duran from Arizona State University and Wilson Okello from Pennsylvania State University. Uh, it's it's uh, it really is a, a gift to just share space with you all. Um, I'm grateful, grateful for the opportunity to, to be in conversation over these next couple of hours. Uh, my name is Wilson O'Kello. I am an assistant professor um, at the Pennsylvania State University. And um, again, having an opportunity just to be in conversation with you all, folks who I've read and, and learned from, um, I'm excited, excited about the opportunity. And so Antonio, do you wanna um, introduce yourself? Uh, and then we can talk about how we, we might structure the, the conversation. 
Wonderful. Well, hi, folks. Uh, as Wilson um, mentioned, it is such a joy and pleasure to be able to spend some time with you all today. And I also can't imagine a better co-facilitator to do this with. Um, so my name is Antonio Duran. Um, you can call me Antonio. Uh, pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and I am an assistant professor at uh, Arizona State University in the higher and post-secondary education program. And I know that we are gathered here today to talk a little bit about uh, the bold scholarship that uh, really has compelled and moved forward our field of higher education and student affairs. Um, and we're excited to be sharing this space with you all as people who contributed to these documents or, or were around and part of the thought partners um, as these documents emerged. Um, and so I know that Wilson and I have some questions prepared uh, for us to learn a little bit about how uh, the scholarship really compel the field, um, how we can contextualize and perhaps critique um, some of the scholarship in these formative documents that we're going to speak about. Um, and then lastly, how we might be able to imagine the future of student affairs and higher education scholarship using these documents as guiding um, ideas. And so with this, Wilson, you think it's probably best uh, to have people introduce themselves? I think so. So we can uh, we can go around. We can do some uh, introductions, and then, um, as Antonio mentioned, uh, we've structured the conversation across three segments. Uh, we'll think uh, particularly about uh, sort of the genealogy um, of uh, these these ideas. Um, we want to think about the current context, and we want to do some um, some imagining with you all, some future thinking uh, with you all, and so. Um, after introductions, um, I will sort of usher us into the first set of conversations, uh, and then we will uh, kind of move throughout um, throughout our time. And so, yes, if we could uh, go around um, as if we're in a circle, um, I will start with my uh, immediate right. And so, uh, Dr. Comedes, uh, would you be willing to to get us started with that? just a, an introduction of who you are? Uh, my name is Susan Comoves. I'm Professor Emerita from the University of Maryland. I was ACPA president in 1982-83. Beautiful. Dr. Dr. Roberts. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Denny Roberts, and uh, I live in Chicago. I'm semi-retired. I still write a lot. Uh, and uh, most recently was uh, uh, employed in the Arabian Gulf uh, in, in the wonderful little country called Qatar. And uh, I was ACPA president in 1985-86. Dr. Domain. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dre Domain, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, my day job, I'm at Davidson College. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Student Life. And I also was ACPA president from 2022 to 23. Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth Witt. You can call me Liz or Elizabeth or whatever. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of California uh, at Merced. Um, I've been here about 10 years. I came uh, for the first six years. I was the vice provost and dean for undergraduate education. I was never president of ACPA, <laughs> um, but I was on the board of ACPA and NASPA board. And I think maybe Larry and I are the only people on the planet who can who can say that. Dr. Roper. Yeah, hi, I'm Larry Roper. I'm Professor Emeritus of Language, Culture, and Society from Oregon State University. Um, yeah, I can't get elected president of my own house. So um, but uh, likely as I have served on the boards of um, ACPA and NASPA. Dr. Koo. Hi, well, I'm George Koo, Chancellor's Professor Emeritus of Higher Ed at Indiana University, and I join Liz and Larry and all the others out there who've never been elected to any office. I, that's not true. I was vice president of my fifth grade, fifth grade class, um, won by a couple of votes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Excellent. Um, well, following the, the lead that uh, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Comoves uh, ushered us into thinking about the, the genealogy um, of our scholarship, um, we're wondering if 
um, you all could talk to us about just your connection uh, to some of the, the formative documents that have helped to shape the field. We're thinking particularly about documents like Tomorrow's Higher Education, um, Powerful Partnerships, Student Learning Imperative, Good Practice in Student Affairs, Learning Reconsidered, A Bold Vision Forward. Uh, we'd love to for you all to just spend a few moments talking about your entry points, um, how you come, came to that work, folks you were thinking about or thinking with um, as that scholarship um, came, came to the fore for you. Maybe we ought to start in uh, kind of historical order, Benny. You must have been, what, 14 when Tomorrow's Higher Education I read was that published it. by Bob Brown? That's right. Yeah, I, you know, and it, it's interesting being a part of this and representing Tomorrow's Higher Education Project because I was a beneficiary of it rather than a creator of it. And as far as I know, there's only one of the folks that were most involved in THE uh, still living, and that's Judith Prince, and she lives in Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, so she's still here. She's not involved in student affairs, but uh, she's still with us. But I, I did some research on, you know, the various people that were involved, and I'll talk about that later. But the weird thing is that I was such an incredible beneficiary of THE, but didn't even know it. Uh, because I was an undergraduate at Colorado State University, which was actively experimenting with THE ideas, and I had no idea that I was an experiment. Uh, and I was empowered as a student leader, crazy empowered, uh, and did things that probably most undergraduate students weren't able to do. And it uh, led me to then pursue a, a career in higher education. And that took me to Maryland, which was then again another place experimenting with ideas. And there I studied with Lee Kneffelkamp. And, uh, you know, it was the combination of just being immersed and empowered uh, as a recipient of that THE project. And uh, I, it was just a remarkable time. And I also attended uh, the 1976 conference that was in Minneapolis that Clyde Parker convened. And I'll talk about that a little bit later too. And Clyde was on the THE committee and uh, that 76 conference convened for the first time uh, that I know of uh, most of the major developmental theorists that were active at that time in a format that allowed graduate students to interact with them. So, you know, we got to chit chat with Bill Perry and uh, the Heaths and various people. and. That then led uh, those of us that were graduate students at that time to begin our own scholarship. And in fact, you know, I translated the Perry model to how do you enhance student learning uh, in leadership? And then that led to my first book uh, foray and uh, uh, documenting, you know, how you could apply developmental theory to the idea of leadership learning uh, and a variety of other things related to, to leadership. So. Basically, it's it. I contributed eventually, I think, to the student development literature, and I tried to um, continue to speak about the importance of that work. But more than anything, I was a beneficiary and a recipient of the project. I have a lot of deep background that also can be edited out, but I mean, I took kind of literally, you know, your suggestion that you kind of lay out the these big words you all use these days, the socio-cultural, you know, uh, what uh, setting at the moment in time. But I, I got to go back to uh, kind of the late 70s and early 80s um, because there were these spate, the spate of reports about the late 70s and 80s. And I had to look this up. I, I don't remember it myself. I was too busy trying to get tenured at Indiana University during the Iranian oil crisis of 79, but that extended into the early 80s. And then there came this, uh, what was then a bombshell report, uh, A Nation at Risk. It was 1983 that it came out. It was a federally sponsored project and all sorts of bad news was coming out about the educational system, if we can call it that, a K-12 through higher ed. Uh, and uh, um, I mean, one of the things that, again, I was reminded of 
uh, is that if you don't know the past, you're more likely to repeat it or at least be informed about what we ought to do in the present. Present, And, uh, you know, we have history courses, history of higher ed, and maybe some of us cover, you know, his, well, I used to a little bit, you know, the history of student affairs with some of these reports. But if you go through those reports, uh, that is a nation at risk which essentially said the sky is falling. It didn't have a lot specific to say about higher ed other than it was kind of in laboring in the same kinds of morass and mediocrity that K-12 was at, at the time. And so they had a number of recommendations uh, about uh, trying to better understand the quality. Of, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize words that I think ring true today assessing the quality of teaching and learning, right? In classrooms, labs, studios, studying the relationship. This, this is their language. And remember, we all write from our time and place. So to put too heavy a hand on the specific words that people use in the context of today sometimes can misalign the, the meaning. But, you know, they said we ought to be studying the relationship between college admissions and, and what students study in high school for example. Uh, and then we ought to be identifying programs and practices and policies that enable students to succeed in college. Does any of that sound familiar? No, this is 1983 when we're writing about that. They had a number of other recommendations for different groups and so forth and so on. But just to tweak this a little bit more, uh, this is 1983 they're writing. We have uh, about a fifth of all four-year colleges and universities in those days were essentially open admission, including the Ohio State University in those days. Now, they've since changed their admission requirements, right? Uh, there was a decline in what colleges were expecting students to come to uh, college with. You, you know, about a, about a quarter of institutions dropped language requirements that, you know, there, there was a time when most institutions said you had to have a couple of years of study of language in high school. Anyway, uh, on and on it goes, including another quarter of institutions that says something about that their selectivity dropped in the 70s. And these were some of the more selective institutions. So on and on it goes. This is 1983, and this was immediately followed because I think they launched these, quote, major studies in the same year, something called involvement in learning. Now, I'm not wanna, don't want to put, you know, our good colleagues Antonio and Wilson on the spot. But when was the last time you read that report? Uh, and, and that's a question for, for everyone. Again, if you read that report, this is, this is foreshadowing the very same issues we continue to deal with today. And, and that report had a long title, including uh, Realizing the Potential of American Higher Education. And it was uh, uh, the study group on the conditions of excellence in higher ed that, and it was led by a number of people that we would all recognize, you know, Sandy Aston and uh, Herman Blake, who was a great leader, founder of Oaks College in Santa Cruz. Anyway, uh, a number of people contributed to that document. But if you read it, uh, and the, the early pages have to do with the changing nature of institutions, society, and the characteristics of college students. So it's not like these folks were unimpressed with the increasing diversity of undergraduates. Uh, Two out of five at that time were over the age of 25. Now it's probably three out of five, maybe even a little bit higher. Uh, fewer than three and five attending college full time. You know, people like me still stuck in the day when you're, you're 18 and living on campus and going to school full time. Well, these folks recognize that that wasn't the way things were then, <laughs> let alone the way things are now changing technologies and so forth and so on. But that report focused on three things. Uh, I, I'm going to get to the student learning imperative, I think, here momentarily, but it was increasing student involvement. And this was definitely Sandy Aston's influence on this committee, right? That was that was a condition of excellence. The second was realizing high expectations. Going back to the previous report, A Nation at Risk, when expectations seemed to be lower and lower and lower about preparing students and what they were expected to do in college. And the third, uh, was assessing student outcomes. Those were the three major 
points, and each had several or more recommendations going along with them, as well as recommendations for other groups, you know, state policymakers and, and for students as well. It had a little section on what students themselves ought to be thinking about and getting ready to do when they finally got to college. Well, th these two things were in the mid 80s. And shortly after that, the Kellogg uh, Commission, this was a, a, a association of public and land grant universities. Some of us can remember the name of its forerunner. Uh, but but the, the, they released a series of reports. And, and in what was it, 2001, there was a summary document. And that, well, let me just say, there was very little said about student affairs in any of these documents. <laughs> uh, it, it, this ought to sound familiar to us. You know, it's like we, we, we were maybe even part of the problem. I don't know, but, but, but there wasn't anything direct in those reports about, uh, th there was an acknowledgement of, of life outside the classroom, but not much more. You know, Denny, it's like they had never read Tomorrow's Higher Education. You know, <laughs> it, 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 that, that was not on their radar screen. But these are the things through the mid, late, and then early 1990s that prompted Charles Schroeder, uh, as we say, took the proverbial bull by the horns and convened a group of us uh, at his, I assume he still has it, uh, Estes Park State in Colorado, uh, to kind of noodle around about what ought to be, uh, it wasn't a student affairs response to this, but uh, the document, uh, the student learning imperative, of course, it has a colon, if we'll remember this, and it was referring back to these previous documents, and the colon was implications for student affairs. So it included some of the folks who were working on these previous documents. I'll mention uh, Sandy Aston again. Uh, Helen Aston was there, but it was a it was a small group. I don't know, eight or ten of us, uh, so-called scholars like myself, and practitioners. So there's some names on that document or a part of that kind of study group that I suspect people today won't recognize. Uh, Paul, okay, I'm going back to Antonio and Wilson here. Uh, who was Paul Bloland? Ding, you know, that's the wrong answer. Okay. So who, you know, who was Ann Pruitt? Who was Michael Rooney? M Michael happened to be from, the, he was our kind of a two-year college, community college sector, but there were other folks, uh, Liz Nuss, who was the uh, exec at NASPA at that time. So this is Charles making certain that the uh, uh, that the, the gesture across the organizations, and, and I should say, uh, there was some acrimony in those days in the early 90s between those two organizations for something that NASPA did that ACPA didn't like and yada yada. I was part of that, my, part of that myself. Ernie Pascarella, uh, so there was this group, a couple of three others were involved in there uh, as well. And I ended up, uh, because apparently I didn't have enough interesting things to say during that three-day meeting, I ended up being the scribe for our deliberations. And uh, so I drafted something, and then it went back out to everybody. And, uh, you know, we, we were, I guess, using clunky email at the time, nothing like we have today to kind of fashion things out very, very quickly. And uh, not to go through, uh, maybe we can go through the document later if you if you like, but uh, because these were implications for student affairs, there was a heavy emphasis on how student affairs folks, how life learning experiences outside the classroom could in, impact student learning and personal development. That was our charge. That was our challenge. We had five categories of recommendations. So I'm not going to bore you with those now, although I do have them in front of me if someone wants me to do a dramatic reading later. But it was making certain, or at least strongly urging student affairs to make certain that the mission and activities of the student affairs division were aligned uh, and congruent with the institutional mission. That was something that was coming out of our work uh, with involving colleges, that book back in the early 90s, and a lot of other things that were circulating in the field at that time. The report, uh, the SLI, as we'll refer to it, I mean, it got a fair amount of attention. Uh, the next year, uh, 94, was uh, the ACPA meeting in Indianapolis, and so there was, you know, some buzz about it there. There was some buzz on it 
certain institutional, you know, campuses. Some of us were invited to go and talk about it. But I also want to highlight another, I think, um, I guess, uh, oh, extraordinary, maybe a little over the top, but John Dalton was the incoming NASPA president. And I'm not sure about the year. It might have been 95. Uh, and he chose, what was that, Liz? 94? 94. Yeah. Uh, he chose, uh, uh, so he must have been the convention chair or something, but he chose to make uh, the learning imperative a focus of the NASPA meeting because he found it, um, well, I can't, I can't speak for him, but the point was, I thought this was a very unusual cross organization fertilization of finding something that the student affairs field could glob onto. Um, and Liz will, well, you're not supposed to talk about your monograph that followed that, but you should at some point, because Liz then edited a monograph. Several of us had chapters in it that was to further flesh out what learning imperative and associated ide ideas would mean for the student affairs profession. And finally, I'll just say Charles Schroeder again, uh, introduced the idea of developing a magazine, something that would be accessible to a wide variety of audiences on college campuses. And that was, uh, that was the, the initiative that launched About Campus. And that was in 1995. And so some of the same people were involved in getting uh, getting that publication off the ground. So the SLI um, didn't come out of nowhere. It it was, in fact, uh, a, 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 it's very easy to track what had been happening the previous 10, 15, 20 years uh, in, uh, in groups that were looking at the quality of learning, but not just in higher ed, but through the educational system. Uh, and uh, the SLI was focused specifically on how student affairs could carry that, carry that message forward. I, I got involved. Um, my connection to the principles of good practice was that um, I was the co-chair with Greg Blumling of the project. And um, this was uh, an explicit partnership between ACPA and NASPA. Um, Greg took the lead for ACPA. I took the lead for NASPA. Um, at the time, I had, as as George said, at the time I had been working on some projects for NASPA, kind of, and for the field. When John Dalton was elected president of NASPA, he contacted me. Um, that's how I ended up on the NASPA board um, to take the lead on coordinating, um, um, engaging um, NASPA. Um, for example, the 1996 conference in conversations about student learning and student affairs work. Um, he wanted a NASPA monograph, which um, eventually um, George mentioned, it's called Student Learning as Student Affairs Work. Um, John, and, and I, it's good that um, George brought that, brought John into this because he played a really important role. He called me and he said, the student learning imperative isn't an ACPA document. It's a call, a charge, um, a challenge to the field of student affairs. And, you know, we we were at the time and it, for the next, I don't know, maybe this conversation is some evidence of the document du jour sort of ethos of the associations. ACPA is this one and that's, you know, and every everybody comes in and has their, um, the THE um, stuff was, I was a new master's student at Michigan State and that was threaded through the whole, um, our, our curriculum even though years later, Lou Stamatakis claimed not to have been interested in student development when it came along, but that wasn't true. Anyway, um, so the, the principles of good practice um, was sort of a follow-up to the student learning imperative and those other conversations. Um, uh, broached, approached, ordered um, by, charged by uh, Paulo Liaro and Suzanne Gordon, um, the presidents of the two associations. The student learning imperative talked about creating powerful learning environments, student affairs folks creating coherent, powerful learning environments. The principles of good practice was a way, if you will, to sort of operationalize that. So if, if we're going to create um, 
powerful learning environments for students. If that's a role of student affairs, that, then, then how do we do that? Um, what might be some principles? Um, what might be some practices? Um, also, at the time, there were, you know, we were that we had sort of listomania, you know, uh, in search of excellence and total quality management and all these, and, and this notion of best practice, which still is a phrase that makes me crazy because there is no such thing. But so we we also were um, heir to uh, the, the process of the, the principles of good practice for undergraduate education, which um, Chicking, Chickering and Gamson um, took the lead on. And in fact, our chickering became part of our uh, principles of good practice conversation. So it was, a, 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 I think, a really logical flow from the conversations about student learning as, as student affairs work. Um, how do how do we how might we do that? What are some guidelines? What are some practices? And with that, I'll be quiet, Larry. You can. Um, Larry was part of the group. We brought a bunch of people together in Chicago. Um, George was part of it as well. Yeah, I, I was a tag along, and it was a fascinating experience. Um, I don't have much else to add other than I think some of the other issues that were accompanying, particularly those of us who are practitioners who are coming into the room, uh, were all of the things that flowed out of the kinds of work that Liz talked about in terms of the, the total quality management, and particularly the accountability challenges. Um, there was a lot more um, pressure. Um, or growing pressure on higher education to prove its worth um, and to justify it through accountability measures um, and outcomes, and which is why I think sort of the, the TQM um, was was taking over many campuses or at least entering the conversations of many campuses. Um, but there's also challenges and, and criticism about the even the moral and ethical climate on campus. Uh, so I think those things were all part of what influenced our thinking about um, the principles um, and the practices, particularly, as I said, from a practitioner's perspective. I'd and also add, too, that um, in constituting the group, we, and, and also in thinking about the principles, um, we wanted to ground our work in research and scholarship and practice and 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 have people who integrated those kinds of things. We also wanted both our work and the principles to be inclusive of the diversity of the student affairs field, the roles and in institutions. Um, you know, it's really easy to come up with a list and set it out here that doesn't think about the context, um, that doesn't speak broadly. Um, we were trying to um, do something, come up with something that would facilitate conversations on, on campus that wasn't, they were guidelines, not standards. Um, they were means, not ends. Um, we hope that they would be um, provoked discussions about, so what do these mean for our place, um, as opposed to um, something that folks would just set aside. So we tried to um, reflect um, the 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 current issues, the current climate, but also think about. I, I don't think we were thinking about timelessness. I think we were talking. We were thinking about about relevance um, and and provoking conversations. And as I said, George was part of that too. So. Yeah, and I'm not sure if we're in the socio cultural part whether that's being woven in or not, but I think um, we were still wrestling with affirmative action um, in a different way. So we had lived with the Baki decision, and in 1996, they had just the Hopwood decision um, had been ruled on by the courts, which basically said that um, we'd gone far enough with Baki and that, in their words, racial preferences um, were no longer were no longer no longer needed, and so the question about diversity in higher education uh, was a prominent issue. I think the other thing is that there was a really important report um, outside of student affairs that, at least on the campuses that I was on, was really important one, and it was a report that was done by um, ACE um, that had grown out of the, some work with the Education Commissions of the state, which was called One Third of a Nation. 
Um, and it was it was um, one third of a nation in a minority participation um, in education and American life. And the title grew out of this um, Franklin Roosevelt's um, inaugural address where he talks about one third of a nation being ill-clad, Ill ill-housed, and ill-nourished. And this report was based on the fact that there was a new one third of a nation. And it was, in their words, again, minorities who were going to constitute more than a third of the enrollment of higher education and that higher education needed to come to grips with how they were going to deal with those changing uh, demographics um, within within higher education. So I thought that was in a really important okay. backdrop. Even though that report came out in the late late 80s, um, it was actually started just picking up steam because I remember attending the one third of a nation national conference in St. Louis in 1997. So um, it was it was receiving a lot of attention at that time. I, you know, there, I, I went back through the information about the principles. I hadn't revisited this stuff for several years. And uh, Jeanetta Cross Brazil and Linda Reiser wrote, um, we, we had the principles. There were seven principles. Um, they became, we, we, pro, we had lots of processes at the at conferences. We um, talked about them. We shopped them around. We got hundreds of lots of feedback. They were published in 97. And then we, um, the group published a book through Josie Bass that came out in 1999. Jeanette across Brazil and Linda Reiser wrote um, the chapter about good practice, um, creating inclusive and supportive communities. And um, if, if I just, I just want to read two sentences from that, that chapter. They said, perhaps one of the greatest contributions any institution of higher education can make to its students is an appreciation for inclusiveness, which was the word that we were using. It's an increasingly difficult task, given the public ambivalence and outright hostility to anything that reflects diversity, difference, affirmative action, or other like-minded endeavors. That was written in 1998. I don't know if that's good thing to know or if it's a depressing thing to know um but uh, i think that that it picks up on um maybe that time as well as um now and what's interesting in the context of all the comments that we've heard is that there's this constant struggle between uh, uh student affairs gaining legitimacy you know and so uh Frankly, it has sought to do that by drafting statements, you know, and what I think is really interesting is the historical evolution of this. I mean, we started <clears throat> in 1937 with a student personnel point of view, and we had ACE say it for us, which was they formed a committee that was a combination of a couple of student affairs people, but mainly non-student affairs people to legitimize the work of student personnel. Uh, and then that was followed up in 49. And both of those statements uh, really were trying to gain legitimacy and make a place, you know. And then as other statements came along, and particularly the powerful partnerships uh, statement is a, a statement that I've used in my work uh, very actively because I've always struggled in my administrative capacity in trying to build relationships with my academic colleagues and to say to my academic colleagues, this is a partnership, you know, we're, we're both doing this, you know, and student affairs isn't the, the purview of student development, that's a shared responsibility. Student learning in the classroom, that's not exclusively uh, a faculty member's responsibility, that has to be supported by co-curricular, uh, complementary things. So uh, I think that the powerful partnerships model, uh, even though probably it's not referenced as much as some other documents might be, it had a lot of really good stuff in it. And uh, I hope we don't forget the fact that that was giving us a good way of bridging to our academic colleagues. And interestingly enough, also powerful partnerships was done again in partnership with uh, instead of this time with ACE, it was done with AAHE and NASPA. 
So Powerful Partnerships was an interassociation effort involving student affairs and academic affairs to try to make a statement, let's cooperate, let's work on this together, which I think is a very important part of this entire conversation. Just to continue that thread, the third plank, if you will, in the SLI was uh, that student affairs professionals collaborate with other institutional agents to promote student learning and student development. So that, I mean, I just want to make sure we see these threads that kind of continue throughout these documents and get expanded, uh, fleshed out further as we learn more about how to do the work more effectively. Yeah, and, and George, I, I have to add that your your comment just then is a paraphrase from Esther Lloyd-Jones in 1954 in her book called Deeper Learning and Leadership. It is an exact paraphrase. She said yeah. it before. Yeah. It comes around again. Yeah. Well, and 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 collaboration partnerships um, were one of the principles of good practice. Um, one of the criticisms levied at higher education, levied at, at student affairs at that time was fragmentation and specialization, um, not working with the whole student, even student affairs folks, not working with the whole student. So partnerships um, were one of the um, collaboration, relationships, community um, was um, one of the principles, but also those were also um, those also wove through the principles as well as these other um, documents. I think it's important to note that that um, as George has has uh, started the conversation around, there's a dialectic kind of cycles that go that in the early 80s, there was a reform report every six months. There was one that came out. Uh, general yeah, education, yeah. minorities in higher education, reclaiming a legacy, equity and excellence. And then people like Bloom and Earth that just kind of uh, fired at everybody with what they thought about higher education. Uh, and the next cycle out of that is, well, then how? what do we do to address what some of the problems are that really need addressing? And many segments do that for their own segment first. So we in student affairs looked at ourselves first and faculty, groups looked at themselves first, but we see out of those responses in the 1990s, uh, things like scholarship reconsidered, the third of a nation uh, involving colleges, George, that great work that you and your teams have done, American Imperative, um, bargain, Bar and Tag moved us from teaching to learning, uh, Kellogg Commission, although they don't mention student affairs, their very first publication in that project with the land grant colleges was returning to our roots, the student experience. So we were seeing segments in everybody's sectors that were coalescing. And how do we pull some of that together? I do have to give great credit, George, to you and your colleagues, the legacy that you all contributed in the 90s and 2000s in everything that you did uh, fed, I think, all sectors in those segments. And it really made a big difference. Difference. Um, in 2002, AAC and you came out with a terrific document called Greater Expectations. Uh, it was done, however, by four faculty and 21 administrators, and it excluded any reference to student affairs or the co-curriculum, even though mentioning dimensions in it like study abroad and a variety of things that would have been logical places to encourage embracing curriculum co-curriculum. Um, uh, we confronted AAC and you on that. I say we, but some of us met with them and they said, well, we're, our audience is faculty. So we're trying to get faculty and deans to see things differently. And that's why we wrote it that way. Uh, in 2002 then, uh, Gwen Dungy and NASPA president, Teresa Powell, contacted several of us about a document they wanted, a, a committee they wanted to put together called Blueprint for Student Affairs Task Force. And we readily agreed as we got into that to partner with ACPA. And so it was a joint project between those, our two associations and resulted in 2004's Learning Reconsidered. And we didn't want that document to be a new, um, uh, foundational document like the student personnel point of view is, what we wanted to do was say, okay, instead of being in our own sectors, let's build on the foundational strengths that we all bring and look at what are the outcomes we want students to have 
how do we envision those? How, where do the, are those created across the environment? How do we work better across the environment as powerful partnerships had advocated for? So we're bringing together the threads of a lot of these previous documents to be uh, an invitation for student affairs educators to our colleagues in all sectors to engage in the dialogue and planning for an institution-wide student outcomes emphasis. And that reinforces, I think, in our field, because the document was created to appeal to all these variety of audiences. We even came up with three different products uh, trying to be audience focused. One of them was a little brochure. One was a slick monograph type publication that got distributed to all colleges and universities. And another was a larger PDF document for grad preparation that went into more detail on neurobiological and other kinds of dimensions of learning. Um, but the audience idea was to get people engaged in dialogue on their campuses using one of those products around how should higher ed hold the whole environment responsible for students learning because academic learning and personal development are certainly intertwined with each other and it's going to take all of us to create these outcomes for students. So that document resulted in learning reconsidered and um, Jeannie Steffes, who was the incoming ACPA president at the time, gathered together with Gwen Dungy a variety of other associations like uh, CUHO, ACUI, uh, NACA, and NURSA to create a document called Learning Reconsidered II that tried to operationalize how we can implement the assessment of these learning outcomes and how they are implemented. Uh, at about this time, I was coming in as president of CAS. And CAS had adopted 16 learning outcomes across the board that they refined using the learning reconsidered outcome groups that were largely based on George and some colleagues work. And uh, they have since adapted that document to a more advanced, I think, um, uh, set of learning outcome guidelines. But the impact then of all of these pulling together through learning reconsidered to me really did help a whole lot of things go forward in campus-wide looks at learning outcomes that then AAC and U with the LEAP project, with uh, George's work with high impact practices and other things really took off in terms of some at least um, acceptance of looking at the whole environment in, of which student affairs and the co-curriculum was a major contributor. I guess a couple of things. I think for me, I entered the conversation. Um, I started in higher education around uh, 2011. So literally right as, as I was about to be in my master's degree, the framing of what was happening in our country around that is kind of where I learned uh, pedagogically my work um, overall. So for me, I the way that I see my entrance into this is that having a critical paradigm um, has been a big part of the work that I've done. And I, I've actually spent uh, the majority of my career up until two years ago doing diversity, equity, inclusion um, as a functional area of my work. And so that's kind of how I personally enter. Um, to speed up the timeline a little bit, um, 2012 was a big year for us in our country, right? Uh, it was our first time having an um, F-color president. Um, that was a big deal. And I think um, there was an opportunity to have um, Obama as our president, but also I think it unearthed a lot of tensions in our country. Again, not an isolation from a tension we already had, but it definitely elevated some things um, in our country. Um, I also think social media was a big impact um, in the world that we're in in higher education. And so I remember vividly uh, teaching in the classroom and having um, a lot of more social um, connection between students across campuses through Facebook and Twitter and things like that. And the ways in which um, racialized violence was happening in our country, uh, particularly to um, uh, black folks in our country was a really big deal. So how ACPA and how my document, my, my co-document with my colleagues came to be, um, in part I think happened through, we used to gather, we still gather, um, in the summertime, so we had a leadership meeting for all of our various entity groups in ACPA, state chapters, commissions, coaches and networks. And as we're trying to do, you know, the business of the association to plan for our upcoming convention, some of us, including myself in particular, were incredibly distracted by getting ongoing reports of the latest shooting, the latest violence that was happening. And so there literally was a moment in our meeting where we had to just stop the conversation and say, we can't treat business as usual when around us in the world that we're in is increasingly responding and navigating and, and grieving over some violence overall. Um, 
that conversation um, in part inspired our then governing board led by Donna Lee at the time to really have a critical conversation as a board about what do we as an association do about all that we're seeing in our world overall. And from that, Donna, along with incoming president Stephen Quay, uh, decided to announce the strategic imperative for racial justice decolonization. And I actually should back up, it was actually was initially just racial justice. <laughs> and so most people don't always remember that history. Um, the reason we added decolonization was because we got called in, right? We had some of our members who were indigenous, who are indigenous, who did not feel included in our imperative. They thought, yes, racial justice is important. However, we need to problematize it a little bit more to really kind of understand the ways in which uh, colonization has impacted our country for indigenous populations and the ways in which they have a unique experience with oppression. Um, there, there are some similarities, but there are also some distinctions. So we, as a board, had to do a lot of learning about that and also educating our members about the importance of adding decolonization. Um, in full transparency, <laughs> Stephen Quay, um, who is a dear friend of mine, I think, don't think he'll mind me saying this, he very much has said, we're going to do this as an association. It's a priority. We're going to do it. But we had a lot of members um, asking us, well, how? What, is, what do you mean? Can you give us language? Can you help us figure it out? Um, my first entrance was um, Stephen Quay had asked me to be a co-chair for curriculum to develop some readings, some uh, dialogue spaces for our members and our leaders to begin to entertain racial justice decolonization. Um, that was a very hard project that did not launch. <laughs> Eventually, our, our Convention 22 team, um, excuse me, our, our Convention 18 team was able to create some curriculum, but we decided, you know, we need to sit down and write hard language, hard conversations about what is it we really mean about racial justice decolonization? What does that look like? How do we incorporate that into the work that we do in student affairs and higher education? Um, we're very lucky that our foundation was able to support us to actually gather in person. And I, I often tell people when they ask me about the experience, um, it is one of the most cherished writing experiences I ever had to be literally travel to Detroit together, to spend a couple of days together, to not only learn who we are, but to have a lot of conversations about our visions, our dreams, our challenges with racial justice decolonization. Prior to that, in-person gathering, we, um, yes, read all the documents that all of you have, have so eloquently talked about, but we also added some others. So we did read um, a couple of pieces um, um, outside of higher education around decolonization to really think about what do we mean by this. But we also were deeply influenced by uh, Grace Lee Boggs' book, um, The Next American Revolution, which is why we ended up in Detroit, because uh, Grace Lee Boggs did her work in Detroit. So it was really powerful to read her book and then actually be in Detroit the, the actual ground in which she did so much um, powerful change work. Um, as we first entered the document, we just talked about what is our dream? What does racial justice decolonization look like? And after sharing all of that, um, the brilliant Dr. Alex Lang, um, who is an amazing visual uh, capturer, started writing freestyle, kind of capturing our language and, and emerged um, what is now kind of our unofficial model and our framework. Um, what was really important for us, um, yes, we have principles and the ways these other documents do too, but the very core of our work is the foundation of love. And so we really drew from bell hooks um, and this idea that love often is talked about in this um, amorous way for partnership um, family, but we really wanted to connect that to humanity, like how we can't even begin to do the work of change and uh, decolonization until we can even see each other as human beings and how we treat and care and be in partnership with each other. And from that, we have um, spurred uh, nine components that are important to us in terms of racial justice colonization. Um, what I also think is really important, thanks to technology, which is why I brought up social media before, while we were in Detroit, we were actually able to hop on Facebook Live, uh, kind of give an update of our progress um, as a writing group. And we got member feedback in real time about how does this land for you? Does this work? What have you? Which I think is a very unique opportunity for us to have to actually be in um, conversation with our members and that feedback. And from that, we just edited and revised um, overall. So, um, you know, I think it was a very, for me, I think I would end by saying our document was timely. It definitely was important of the, the time in which we were in the United States, but we are also, I think, we're ahead of the game a little bit. Um, if you were paying attention to 2020, <laughs> we had a big reckoning there, uh, you know, again, with thinking about George Floyd and thinking about challenges to immigration. Um, it was really um, 
I felt very proud as a co-author um, and incoming president eventually to know that we had started this conversation much earlier than other associations and that we had something that our members could go to in a critical time in our country when um, we really, I felt our members and our students need a lot and our, our faculty and staff need a lot of help. So um, that's a little bit there. I could add more later, but that's kind of the critical where we are now. Um, and I think now as exiting president of um, ACPA, I'm in my last year, um, it's been really beautiful to see how that foundational document is now spurring not only um, the different institutes and um, that we're doing, but also there have been a couple of other documents that have spurred since that, that time that it launched back around 2018-19. So, yeah. I think this, is, this has been just a, a beautiful uh, sort of witnessing. Uh, I appreciate the, the generous tracing that you all have offered us. Um, the ways in which these documents have um, worked in conversation with one another, how you all have um, intentionally and or uh, just by nature of being generous colleagues, um, thought about ways to, to integrate uh, what was happening in the moment and or prior to you into the work that you were doing. Um, and it certainly sounds like it was um, um, instrumental in um, the, the cultivation of these documents. And so um, as a perhaps a uh, entry point into our, our next segment, um, I'm wondering if you all could talk just uh, maybe broadly about the what you see as the collective importance of these documents, uh, particularly as we think about uh, the current moment uh, that we're in. Um, I really appreciate some of the language. Uh, for example, Dr. Ku, you talked about uh, you know writing in a particular time and place, right? Uh, I heard others talking about uh, talk about, for example, the the social cultural context. Um, um, I heard uh, many of you calling individuals names, uh, which I think is really important as just sort of uh, to sort of think genealogically. But I, I really appreciated how you called other names who aren't present uh, into this moment. So I'm yeah, just wondering if you could you could talk about um, yeah, what do you see as a collective importance of these documents um, or even the process by which these documents took shape um, as we sort of enter this, as we uh, sort of reflect on this current moment? Yeah, yeah I, I would like to start um, because I was struck just listening um, to the, the fact that um, community um, as a, as a as a context for the creation of scholarship is very important. Um, and that the idea of people coming together and um, thinking, sharing, being vulnerable, because in those in those spaces, um, there's there's tension and there's risk taking um, that I think produces um, produces the future. Um, and there's an investment in in conversation as a as being a very dynamic activity um as being uh, a creative activity um, i think the other thing that struck me about the the work is that they're collectively that they're appreciative in nature um that they aren't they aren't just critiquing the world as it is but it's um talking about the goodness <laughs> Um, that we can live into and that we can produce um, on behalf of students. Um, and so I just think that there, across all of them, there's a, a, a common ethic or ethos um, of, of service and, and bringing value um, and um, transformation. Um, I, I think that the one of the other things that is so clearly evident in it just rings so deeply in my heart as I heard Dre talking about the creation of the Racial Justice and Decolonization Initiative is that these things do have a historical context that calls us to do something, right? And uh, even going back to THE, even though probably the knowledge about the environment at that time is probably not widely understood. People kind of romanticize what happened in the 1960s, but you know, the 1960s was a very, very tough time uh, for our country. Uh, and we were going through uh, literally an upheaval of you know, the call for relevance, the call for change, the call for engagement. 
And uh, student affairs was really caught uh, kind of flat-footed, <laughs> as uh, I have read in our literature from TAG, at least Clyde Parker very explicitly said this movement towards uh, creating the student development idea was at least partially uh, an attempt to replace the previous legal mandate of in loco parentis because in loco parentis had put student affairs in such a control position uh, and a kind of a service oriented position that they were caught flat footed when literally students were demonstrating in the streets. And as an example, my Dean of Students, Colorado State in the 1960s, Burns Crookston got fired because he, instead of staying in his office and avoiding student demonstrations, he went into the group and talked to them. His picture showed up in the Denver newspapers and he got fired. Uh, he didn't have basically the theory base to justify engaging with students rather than walking away from them and hiding from them. And so the THE, and there's lots of reasons why THE came about, and it's not just about replacing in local parentis. It was, you know, a time of huge growth, you know, so people were in student affairs scrambling to provide residence hall spaces and counseling and expand their student centers. So there was that press too. And you kind of had this, this historical context of kind of a, a moment of ethical question, what is this work? Coupled with the administration of student affairs, how do we make environments available and just physical spaces so that students can be involved? And the other thing that I think is fascinating in this conversation, I don't know whether this threads through the other statements or not, but I, I looked back at the people who were actually involved. The THG project started in 1968, but it really revved up in 1974 when Harold Grant appointed a committee. And that committee included people that probably many graduate students don't even recognize their names these days, but we're talking about Bob Brown, Mel Hardy, Dick Capel, Burns Crookston, and others that were involved in that committee. And if you look at those names, and this is where I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, where does the narrative on these reports come from. The fact that it was, and again, I'll go back to Esther Lloyd-Jones because I just can't give it up because she was so influential. But guess what? Uh, most of the committee members of THE were her doctoral students from Teachers College, Columbia University. So not only was she involved at 37, 49, but she was the doctoral advisor to some of the people that shaped literally the THE. And then guess what happened out of those folks? And we're talking about people like uh, Mel Hardy, who was involved also uh, in that THE committee, but people like Mel and Burns and Harold Grant and Dick Capel, guess who, who, who did they mentor? Oh, they mentored people like Susan Comovez, Charlie Schroeder, Nancy Evans, and Denny Roberts, okay? Uh, you've got a beautiful genealogy here and generativity across generations. And I, I do think we have to pause to make sure that we don't have kind of a, uh, a closing down of our thinking. And I think that what is so beautiful about where we are now is I hope that in fact, our committees are probably not just the doctoral advisees of the people who are pulling the groups together. I think it's more inclusive than that. But I, I do think that it's important to recognize the intellectual and kind of the, the spiritual uh, center of these things. And why did we do this work? We were called to do the work. And all of us have generatively over these reports attempted to make a difference through that. I really appreciate that com comment, uh, Denny, because I think that um, talking about this core that guides the that guided these documents um, and that still continues on to this day is really important for us to consider. Um, and all of you all uh, have touched upon kind of the specific context in which these documents emerged. And yet, as I'm hearing you all at this talk, I'm also hearing these phrases, these key ideas that I think are, are still very much so part of the fabric of our profession today. Um, and so with 
that, the next couple of questions that I have all have to do with uh, both, you know, contextualizing how the scholarship is still relevant, but also how we may be able to take a lovingly critical eye to these documents as we start to move forward into the future. And so um, I actually am going to direct this que the, this question to uh, two folks in particular. Um, and Dr. Witt, you, you will be the first one if it's okay. Um, but in, uh, in, in, namely because I heard you discussing some of these core enduring concepts. But if I were to ask you, what is the relevance of these documents in today's day and age? What may come to mind? And, and Dr. Ku, I'm gonna follow, I'm gonna ask you to go after Dr. Witt, but what is the relevance? What is the continued enduring um, power of these documents? Well, I um, I guess I have to stop and I've I've been thinking about this. In fact, Larry and I got together um, last week um, to have a conversation about this, and so I'd also like to kind of bring Larry into it because he had some very real eloquent things to say about this uh, in response to this relevance issue. Um, I think that um, you know the. I think it's I, th I think a couple of things. I think it's easy to think about these as perhaps time bounded. They're obviously written in a context, but I think that the the context of higher education, the context of student affairs, um, the the looks much like what the for reasons that I think would be an interesting conversation, looks a lot like what was being critiqued 30 years ago. You know, the 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 quotation what Janetta and Linda wrote about um, for all on behalf of all of us about um, about inclusive and supportive communities and the challenges we're facing. Um, I think the the relevance is. Um, that they continue that these are these are ongoing issues. Now, does that mean that the documents weren't relevant because we're still <laughs> facing these issues? Um, I think um, what's most relevant are the underlying principles that we've been talking about: community, um, collaboration, inclusion, um, the the challenge, um, support our students. Um, transformation, change, assessment, accountability. Um, I think those were discussed um, all along, and they're still they're still pertinent. So I think there's relevance um, in the in in though they might be time bound. They I think are also in many ways timeless because we keep hacking away <laughs> at these at these same things. Um, there are new challenges. I, something that occurred to me, I was looking at um, ex some of the examples that we used, um, case studies to talk about the principles of good practice in use. Um, there was one about um, a, a small college. We, we wrote, I think this was, was in about campus maybe. Greg and I wrote a piece um, that, um, about a, a, an arts campus doing a play about the white supremacists and the, 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 what, what happened and how to use the principles of good practice. It was a case study that Peter Magolda created for the um, Region 4 East um, conference. Um, and, and my point, and I do have one, is that this the guy was the 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 vice president for student affairs at this institution the 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 was um given a month to work on this um and sort this out um we don't have that kind of time now um the media attention social media i th i thought a couple of times what you know what if we had to think about social media when we were you know that when we talked about electronic technologies affecting student affairs work we were talking about distance learning um and and so i think there are things that are very different but we still can't lose sight of those key relevant issues of community of care um of, of autonomy of students and so on um 
I don't know. Larry, do you want to do you want to add to that? Because you well, I, I think I, Antonio was going to um, had another question and through which I could address that. Um, so um, okay, we'll get to it. Um, That's fine. Follow up next. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think you did a great job, Larry. Oh, thank you. Dr. Ku, any um, additional comments or thoughts uh, regarding this question of the relevance of these documents? Um, I think Dr. Witt put it, um, you know, even though these were time-bound documents, in many ways, these issues are timeless, and I really appreciated that framing. You know, um, uh, I don't think these documents are, have much relevance today since most people don't know about them. So it's fine for us to... Uh, relive where we were and what we were thinking at the time and so forth and so on. Uh, now, if someone were <laughs> to study these documents and try to decide how they kind of manif the ideas manifest themselves in today's environment, I think that, I think they would be very relevant. As I said, to tried to say in my opening gambit, uh, you use language that fits the time and place, and that language may not mean the same thing today uh, because we uh, maybe have advanced in our thinking and, and in how we approach and we've developed different ideas that represent, I think, some of the very same uh, stuff. That's a technical term. Stuff we were trying to communicate, you know, 40 and 50 years ago. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, back to Liz's point, Larry, too, I think, you know, there are some enduring, well, all of us, I think, have said this in one way or another, there are some enduring, I think, uh, values and concepts and constructs. Uh, you, you know, I was part of the writing team that put together the NASPA perspective on student affairs that came out in 87, which created a bit of a kerfuffle between the two organizations. But, but let me just quickly read some of these um, the academic of the mission is preeminent. Uh, this kind of goes through all of the documents that we've been taught, I mean, at, at least through the SLI and learning reconsidered, I think each student is unique. Would anybody quibble with, with that observation and that value statement? Each person has worth and dignity. These are kind of pillars, if you will, of what we were talk, trying to communicate back in the 80s. Bigotry cannot be tolerated now we don't you know you don't hear that word bigotry very often but it's a very very powerful word and that was one of this these kind of fun feelings affect thinking and learning so all the stuff about neurocognition i mean we didn't have the language back then but what we were trying to communicate is you know you students can't learn at their best if they're conflicted, if they're stressed, if if things are are awful in their family life and so forth, personal circumstances affect learning. Out of class environments affect learning. A supportive and friendly community life helps students learn. And here's one particularly appropriate for the day: the freedom to doubt and question must be guaranteed. Now, does this cover the waterfront? No, but I, I mean, I don't think anybody would would uh, argue that those don't hold sway today. Students are responsible for their own lives. Finally, <laughs> there's the, the, been quite a bit of conversation about this, this these last two weeks, and effective citizenship should be taught. Now, the problem with some of these statements is we would have different interpretations as to what they mean and and how certain folks ought to respond given different kinds of circumstances. So I think I think we have things that are of enduring value. But as I said, if we don't read these documents and we don't talk about them and we don't try to bring them into uh, what into a kind of kind of cohabitation in our own world and work, they don't mean very, very much. Yeah, no, I value well, that. That's a good. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, Antonio, but, um, but yeah, I want to. I I think yes, I agree that that my my yes, they're relevant was, you know, in the in the idea of principles, and, but the but practical relevance, I I absolutely um, I agree with that. Well, I, that. My comment was not a criticism. Of what you're saying, Liz. Um, I didn't hear I, it that way. Yeah. Okay. Good. 
Yeah. Well, and I think that's the purpose behind these kinds of opportunities to speak about these documents such that we resurface them in a lot of ways. Um, but something else that I really appreciate about what you were kind of framing as well is, you know, even though the core principles, as Dr. Witt was talking about, to do endure, perhaps our language and our thinking has shifted um, over time. And in fact, I think this is a really nice transition into this question around in reflecting upon these documents and the impact that they had, in what ways might they have been better attentive to dynamics of power and oppression, um, especially now that we're thinking about this here in ACPA from racial justice, decolonization perspective, how we may, how might we look back on these documents? And I'll open up that question to the three folks that I named um, in the chat function. Um, yeah, I get two things that are on my, the top of my mind is one, um, and we've gotten that feedback since the moment this document came out and is valid. Um, we focus on a US con context, right? So I think there was a way in which our document around racial justice decolonization um, absolutely focused on the bounds, geographical bounds of the continental US, right? And as we're literally witnessing right now of what's happening um, in Gaza, I, I, I wish uh, we had thought a little bit differently about how to bring in some of this work uh, from a global context. And I, from my own standpoint, I'm seeing myself included and my colleagues, we're fumbling on how to talk about not only what's happening um, um, you know, beyond the US, but how that's impacting our students and our dynamics here on campus um, right now. And so um, I've always asked, I've always um, encouraged people when this document came out that um, we were starting a conversation and I've always encouraged people to tear it apart, <laughs> to critique it, to do, do something else. and. And I, I'm still waiting, and maybe that's me, perhaps, but I'm waiting for that to happen. So that's definitely the biggest miss. I also think that the things top of my mind also this morning as I was preparing, I think where we were back in 2015, 16, sorry, back up, um, 18 to 19, so much of the work we were doing um, around racial justice and decolonization was just the 101, if you will, like getting people to understand like what is racial justice and what is decolonization that I, I in rereading the document, and I've been teaching this document in some doctoral classes lately as well, so much of it is focusing on the individual awareness and learning and action, or the interpersonal from maybe how we work with our, um, our students or our staff, what have you, but not a lot of focusing on institutional change. And um, I'm deeply aware now the way that our a political system, our legal system is rapidly changing very quickly, that I don't think we adequately talked about what this firmer could look like from that particular um, standpoint. And so I, um, those are the two biggest misses for me that I, I wish that we, A, have more time to do, and that if I were ever to give an opportunity to do some revisions, that, those are the areas that I would probably focus on. Thank you so much. Dr. Robert. Oh, yeah, so I'll jump in. Um... So just a, a little before I get to the question, just to address some of the things that were in the last question that I think influenced how I respond to this question. Um, and one of us, I think that um, those of us who work in higher education um, need to be multilingual. So we have to have this ability to read, translate, and make sense of things that were not produced in our context. Um, because that then allows us to be able to hear things and see things that are there that if we look only through the frame in which we were formed, we will never see. I mean, we try to teach educators that all across the board <laughs> about making sense of things. Um, and so if you look at the behaviors that are implied, and I'll just take the pencils of good practice, the behaviors of engaging helping, using, forging, building, those are enduring. And I think the point that George made is just very profound and needs to not be lost, is that people use the language that's accessible to them no matter what. If a student's coming and yelling at you, they're using whatever words that are accessible to them at that moment. Whether they make sense to you, whether you would like to have them express themselves in a different way or whatever, they're using the language that's accessible to them. And so if you look at the principles of good practice, 
that document is grounded in the fact that students are the primary architect of their lives and that they maintain complete autonomy over their choices and the path and the direction of their growth. And that we are co-creators with students in that experience. And so the language, though the document didn't use the language of power and oppression, we name autonomy, partnership, loving, nurturing behaviors as a foundation. And those are things that direct people away from oppressive behaviors. So we may not use the language of oppression, but the behaviors of non-oppressive behavior are laid out for people. So again, I think that's why I think the point that George made around if people read the documents and you, you're able to read through multiple frames <laughs> or, or read through language that's not the language that you would use, but that the language of that time, you'll see that those concepts were addressed, that the people in the room talked about that, but we talked about it in the language that we had at that time. If I was talking about the, the, if we were framing this document right now when I was in the room, I would use different language than I used then. Right, so it would be language that's that. So I just think that that's a challenge that anyone who's, when they pick up um, the work that Dre did year from now, they're gonna still have to do that same kind of translation uh, because they'll be using a different language at that time. And they'll say, well, how come she didn't, they didn't address this? Well, they did, but in a, in a language in a way that's not the way that you would describe that work. Such an excellent point. And I appreciate your own personal reflection that if you were in the room right now working on this document, that you yourself would use different language. And I think that is really meaningful to hear. Dr. I, Koba. I think, yes, I think it's, um, I'm glad it's the critique we're doing is based in love for where we were then, where we are now, and what you all will be doing as we go forward. I, I would echo what Larry says about uh, we used the best language at the time and tried to push it, tried to push it further. When I, I would have my grad students read 10 or 12 of these documents and, and critique them on how did it reflect its time, how was it visionary for its time, and what about it is enduring now in any way or form. And so the how it was visionary for its time is often, Larry, around the languaging. The inclusion of certain topics begins to be important over time, and we start shaping and refining and getting a better grasp and dig deeper into what the languaging is around those concepts. So when Doug Woodard and I in 1996 did our first issue, issue of student services, we added new chapters on institutional diversity, uh, student population diversity, and a whole new chapter on multiculturalism, which would have been the visionary use of the language at the time for how do we look at uh, the role of culture in all forms influencing our environments and the student experience. And so I think looking at that with some smile says, and we know you're using language now that someone in 10 years will say, how could you have said that? Didn't you realize it really means this? It's an evolutionary process and recognizing that as mature scholars is a way to say, yes, we can poke at it, we can too. I mean, the things that we wrote. And sometimes you wish you, that people didn't cite some of what you wrote because it's got language that now you would probably not use. I do think that with Learning Reconsidered, we were working very hard to try to write, as Larry referred to, in the community of academe. We were trying to connect with all sectors to work forward on uh, the complexity of student learning outcomes in the mission statement being across the whole institution, the whole environment connecting them. So we, it's implicit that we're saying faculty aren't doing teaching strategies like they maybe could be, but we intentionally didn't want to be attacking faculty. We wanted to be connecting with faculty saying we know this is hard and we need to together be moving forward. So there's a lot of implicit um, choices of recommendations and strategies suggested that get at some aspects of what I'd say would be power and oppression, but they are probably more implicit than they are explicit, except that we start uh, using a lot of language in these uh, documents around personal identity and one's own story, and that becomes one's narrative, and that becomes becomes, if we're looking at research methodology parallels here, qualitative methodologies and narrative and feminist pedagogy and um, queer pedagogy. And we start getting into even then powerful practices might now be liberatory pedagogy. So we have more explicit language to use that brings all new meaning to these. So I, I think that we, um, 
intentionally didn't use language to distance from other segments of the academy while trying to point out that these things were happening and interfering with the ability for all students to learn, for all of us to contribute to that learning. Of course, this translating work that was happening at that time and that can still be really relevant to the ways that we think about these documents today. Dr. Hello, um, any thoughts uh, coming to mind for you as you're hearing this rich conversation? I think the this the comment around uh, what it means to be visionary for its time is is really uh, profound to me. Um, I think it can be really easy as scholars situated in a particular generation uh, to critique, <laughs> um, but um, not take up the responsibility to understand the social cultural context it was written in and what it was advancing um, at that particular moment uh, can sometimes um, elude us uh, as, as scholars and practitioners. Um, I'm also hearing this notion of what it means to stay responsive and or be responsive to the moment, right? And so to use a, a vocabulary, if you will, or a language that others might be able to take hold of and be responsive of. I heard this sense of um, being intentional about not distancing, right? The folks that we need to be in partnership with, right? So there's something really powerful um, about that. Um, Dr. Demay, as you were talking, there was something, uh, you talked about the uh, the uh, the misses. Um, and uh, well, I, I appreciate that. And, and you know, as a, knowing you to be a, a deeply re uh, reflexive uh, individual that I'm not surprised by that, that comment. And um, as I think about the, uh, the work of the imperative, um, I recognize the, um, uh, say the elasticity or the, uh, the, the possibility that is written into that document that you all were really intentional about. So, so no, perhaps it doesn't speak to a particular uh, global context. And I think we would be remiss to say that notions like love and care and relationality and, um, you know, think about agency are not or could not be responsive um, or we, we couldn't take those things up in this moment as we um, seek to uh, uh, to better understand um, and help students and campuses understand uh, this this current uh, global moment. And so, uh, so I think I appreciate that. And as I'm thinking about uh, the imperative, but also all of these documents, I'm um, appreciative of what they do in terms of providing vocabulary, right, the language, principles, and priorities for us to consider as we think about the current context, but also the future. And so as we move uh, into the future, um, what do we do <laughs> with these documents? Um, I, I, I want to maybe move away from the documents per se and just offer an observation. And I could flat out be wrong about at least part of this. And that is... Um, one of the foundational documents when I was in graduate school, Susan and Larry and Denny, was this. Uh, Liz, maybe you had to read this too, but before you got to IU, and that is there was this article, um, student personnel work, a profession stillborn. Maybe. Now, probably no one would. Penny. Penny. Yeah, it was James Penny. I'm not sure, yeah, but. It was. And, and, and this this was a real downer. You know, you didn't want to give this to master's students in the first or second week. Maybe you'd wait until week five or six or something. And like, here, here I've come to. And I think, um, Denny, uh, in some ways, the Tomorrow's Higher Education Project and certainly the monograph that Bob Brown did was kind of a counterpoint to that. They didn't so much lean into student personnel work is what it was called at the time, but it was about there really is a foundational, theoretical, empirical, uh, soul-seeking base to this work, <laughs> this work you know. Um, but I have the, the distant sense today that student affairs work is much more widely accepted as a necessity. It may not be widely accepted by some faculty as... Um, uh, uh, an adjunct or a, um, what an accelerant to the learning and personal development of students, but we can't live without you folks. I think there's a, 
a much more widespread accept, acceptance of that, as there is this thing that we now can say out loud, the value of experiential learning. You couldn't say that 15 years on most campuses because faculty members would just, their eyes would roll back and say, okay, count off to five, go outside, talk among yourselves, fine, you want to help somebody. But that's not what we do. That's not the prime. So I, 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 the, the, those two things I, I, I think are related, not that student affairs has brought a greater acceptance to experiential learning. This is kind of an outside in pressure in higher ed. You know, policymakers, employers, family members want to know that their their student can actually leave this place called the college or university and get a job, can actually contribute to society, make their own way, so forth and so on. Now, what these documents have to say about those two things, I'm not sure. But I think what we don't have to deal with and hopefully won't have to deal with in the future is defending ourselves uh, to the folk inside the institution, because there's a greater recognition um, among faculty, for sure, that the kinds of things that students are bringing with them to the classroom, every person unique, personal circumstances affect learning, they aren't prepared to deal with. And thank God that there are people here who can do that work. George, I'm so glad you mentioned the the Penny article, and you know Bob Brown's response to that uh, return to the academy was, you know, the first step in the THE publications of the many that came out of THE, and uh, you know, in graduate school, we read Penny and Brown, you know, side by side. You know, that was the way to kind of get the dialogue started in terms of what are we doing and why uh, that was so critical. Uh, I I do I I'm, I'm I've got some ambivalence here because I so much appreciated Dre's drawing attention to the fact that the social justice and decolonization initiative didn't include the international world as much as it could have, and then for George for you to say that that faculty appreciate you know student affairs more now than they did before, when we're talking about the international world. And I think that this is something that, and I understand very clearly why ACPA was very cautious of moving into the international arena. And they were justifiably humble by not saying, and this all applies to you as well. Because in, the, in an international setting, it doesn't apply. It has to be adapted and it has to be modified and going back to what we were saying before in the language. and in the language might be the experiential. I mean, in the case of when I worked in Qatar, we translated the student personnel point of view into Arabic so that we could have conversations with our colleagues and so they could put their meaning into that document so that they could understand it as we were trying to create student affairs work there. So, and, and, and the battle there is that frankly, at least in my experience, and this may be very, very unfair, and I, I pray that nobody holds me accountable for this, but uh, some of the expatriate faculty from the United States that are, that are being sent to these branch campuses have very little understanding of student affairs as being a unique and special contribution of American higher education. And people who don't have exposure to US higher education, maybe they were educated in Europe, somewhere else in Asia, Middle East or whatever, it just isn't there. And so our international colleagues who are struggling mightily to make a difference in student affairs work around the world, they have to basically establish their own legitimacy, almost like student affairs had to at the beginning of the 20th century or the middle of the 20th century. And our international colleagues can really use help on that. And particularly because those practices have to be decolonized in themselves uh, because the impact of colonization worldwide is profound, absolutely profound. Uh, and if, if an educator doesn't understand that and understand comparative education, so what does the U.S. model look like if modified for a setting in the Middle East? Uh, there, there has to be that deeper intellectual work to really make our 
uh, our wonderful history of student affairs in the United States work in the international arena. So I, I couldn't help but, but tying both Dre and, and George's comments, uh, George's comments together. I wanted to make a couple comments on, on how these reports, um, based on what you just asked Wilson, but uh, probably to say um, we need perhaps now some new reports. And I have been terribly frightened, I think as many of us are, that um, our legislatures, governors, governments are uh, engaging in practices, including laws that disenfranchise groups of people we have been advocates for, um, that have taken away rights of people that are challenging academic freedom, that have faculty not wanting to go to work in some states now because of how it will challenge the nature of their teaching and freedom and the work that we do, that we're accused of being woke and we say, yes, thank you. You know, but that's not how the public views the kind of work we've done. So at a time when the very role of higher education is being challenged, and we need liberal education for a democratic society. We need colleges to figure this out and respond to make meaning out of it to the public so that they see the value of students and research and scholarship and higher education contributing to the public good and to society at large. And and right now, everyone seems so scared and frightened, particularly in states where, uh, and the number of states is now more than two hands full, uh, where there are even legal actions that could be taken against faculty for what they may say or do, or presidents swooping in, as George and I know, to appoint presidents of universities and fire trustees and all kinds of things, that something needs to happen now that says higher ed as an entity stands for principles and values, and many of those are ones we are leading voices on, but presidents are now under fire to speak out about those and need white papers, they need thought pieces, they need support from their campuses to make those points with the publics of their institutions in their states. So I guess my plea would be, and this maybe jumps really to questions you were planning to ask later, Wilson, but it jumps to, I think these reports, several of them put together, did make change in higher education. They did influence outcomes. They, we can build on them still, but we can't just be talking to each other in this next phase for what we think it means for our student affairs division. It's got to be the student affairs division helping the campus find ways to put the message out about the role of higher education in the public arena. Uh, just That's a point, Susan, you, you, that comment about the current issue, the value of higher ed is, is for me kind of the big elephant in the room because these documents that we've been referring to up through 2010, it was, it was assumed that higher education was both a, com a public and personal good. Now, now there's question about whether it's either. You know, and um, I don't know how these documents <laughs> thinking about it or trying to. Uh, I'm glad I'm no longer really active. You, you, you young, you young folks, you need to figure out how to fix this for us so that we can go <laughs> into that good night feeling better about ourselves. It's really, really challenging. Yeah, I, I thank y'all both for George and Susan for both, both saying that. I think we were on the same page that. When I heard this question, to me, I'm like, these documents are more timely now than, than ever, right? Like I, I, and I, as somebody who does both practitioner and classroom, like I'm constantly trying to find this balance of how do I provide my students or even my new staff that I work with the foundational kind of content of these documents while also thinking about what needs to be adjusted. So for me, I, I, I advocate more than ever that we should know these. I think. And there are times in which these things get lost, right? And I don't want to get them lost and that we're still kind of repeating ourselves. I guess I'm also just in thinking about like, how do we put them in conversation with each other? So I've never thought about pedagogically. Like if I put some more recent documents with older documents, what does that look like and opportunities to add on? Um, but I also want to circle back to, um, I guess there was something that I think, um, gosh, who was it? Diddy, you talked about the international standpoint and I just want to be gentle with that a little bit, right? I there's there are moments where I think we sometimes, and I, I I have a tension point because yes, we are in an international association, but we don't really do that well, right? Um, or there's a ways in which we think that we have kind of um, gotten it right, right? When we have not, right? Um, and that we are also thinking about the ways in which international um, work. Um, it's just very different. Higher ed is very different than how we started higher ed is very different. So I just want to be delicate that 
I think there's still opportunities, but I think I what we also don't do a great job is of learning from you know international higher education. And we don't often receive as learners in this work, right? We're always kind of focusing internally to us in this US context. I just want to be a little bit delicate about how we um think about our documents in a kind of uh su- kind of a supremacy kind of context as well. Well, that's exactly the point I was making about applying the decolonization lens to the way that we work with international colleagues because, you know, so often, uh, you know, the Western practices are just being picked up and plunked down without any consideration of what that means. And frankly, some Westerners don't engage very respectfully, even with our international colleagues. They talk down to them. They marginalize them. Uh, It's, uh, and, and so I, 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 you know, you're 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 speaking my language in terms of we need to tread lightly. And the answer to that may be really how we advocate for working with students. We we should be engaging with students, not imposing ideas upon them and uh, feeling as if we somehow are fixing their lives, you know, in this experience, but instead to think of uh, the things that have been contributed so much through our literature and our research, which says, the way to enhance student learning is to engage with. Uh, and it's a very important thing translated to international. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on the point that um that Susan made about the um the needs of higher education for kind of leadership support for for lack of a better word. Um that about the ways in Georgia the ways in which higher education is imperiled right now. Um, I think we need to find the things that have been so core to our work, particularly for the last you know couple of decades in terms of diversity and inclusion, um, are being demonized. And the um, higher education as an entity is, is being weaponized right now. Um, just look at the way all of a sudden, for the first time I can remember, people are asking for college presidents to make public comments on something, on a social issue. They never asked that about the Ukraine war or anything, but now they, they're trying to smoke people out. So there, there's a setup that's going on. And I think that those who have different protections than presidents have, particularly faculty, need to be able to figure out how they're using their voices to advance the, the values of the, of the academy. And to provide cover, but I believe that they you need to find again the language to do that. It has to be a language that's accessible to those who are being influenced, as opposed to insider language. And so you may find yourself having to retreat to language that you're wondering how do we how do we move away from in order to do that. So it may not necessarily be the contemporary language through which you're going to communicate to get people to hear because they're not living in today's world. You have to communicate to them through a world that they understand and they know and that they can make sense of in order to help to bring them to an awareness of the contemporary challenges and responsibilities of higher education. I don't know how that gets done, um, but I don't know that we necessarily will reach people from where we are here. When I, before I retired, my faculty position home was in the School of Language, Culture and Society, which is where women's gender and ethnic studies were anthropology, world languages, and culture. The language of that department doesn't translate well to the rest of the internal institution, let alone externally. So the question is, how are we going to communicate effectively externally, advancing our values while also being heard and understood? I think that's going to be a real challenge for those who are in the academy right now. I think those are really poignant remarks because they get us thinking about for these documents, so much of the work that was done in trying to translate these core concepts um, around what the profession was and how it was moving forward and how we're still facing those challenges today around how do we engage in these intellectual exchanges? How do we engage in this translating of our values, of our principles, whether it's with our international colleagues, whether it's our local legislators or whether it's with our students bodies. Um, I'm hearing all these different audiences that we need to be more responsive to as time goes forward in these comments. 
um, I do want to be mindful of time. I uh, Wilson and I have been messaging, and it's like we could we could spend um, all day here listening. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have all day. Um, and so, with that, uh, I do want to ask a final question: of Is there has there is there anything left unsaid before we wrap our our time together? Just to, I don't know that this is the most prescient comment, but every generation has to discover for itself what this field is about. Uh, and we can't assume that because the senior student affairs officer may know what they're trying to communicate, that the entry level staff member, despite coming from different contexts and so forth and so on, so uh, some some exposure to, uh, and I don't know whether Susan you were going with this. I thought you heard you make a made a comment that we need to we need to do some additional think tank work and remind us where we are and where we're going. Uh, that would be extremely valuable, I think, to this current I'm going to say younger or formative generation of student affairs professionals. Um, and well, that's all I want to say. It, 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 we just can't assume that folks who are now working in residence halls and in all these very important places on campus um, are familiar with the kinds of core constructs and ideas that run through these documents over the last damn near 100 years now. Right? Yeah. Thank you for that, Dr. Ku. Wise words to perhaps end on with our time together. Um, so with that, uh, both Wilson and I want to thank you all for your deep um, uh, and intellectual contributions today for the generative nature of our conversation. And we do hope that this will be helpful for generations to come as they continue to think about and learn alongside these documents. Dr. Okello, any uh, final comments, thoughts, reflections? Uh, similarly, um, you know, it's a uh, be beyond your your wisdom. Uh, I think you all just uh, you modeled uh, just what it means to do some thinking together, um, and so I, I appreciate uh, again the opportunity to be a part of it, and I'm excited uh, for others uh, to engage with um, your continued work, but uh, this conversation as well. <laughs>